Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. One of the happiest hours of the year for every father comes on Christmas morning when excited little fingers untie the ribbons from their gifts. Yes, this is the season at Christmas tide when a man realizes that his love for his family is the most important thing in the world. Undoubtedly, that's why in December, more than any other month, fathers increase their family's protection with the Equitable Life Assurance Society. After all, what better time is there to see your Equitable Society representative and talk over with him the greatest gift any man can provide for his loved ones, the gift of security through life insurance. Tonight's FBI file, Swampland Killer. Despite many reminders, there are still those who regard the crime wave as something that is happening to someone else, as something that is foreign to their daily existence. Perhaps one single fact simply stated will convince them that the crime wave is a grave concern of every citizen in this nation. That single fact is that there are in the criminal files at FBI headquarters in Washington, the fingerprints of more than six million people, which means that nearly 5% of the adult population of this country have been arrested. That is a sobering figure, a figure that becomes terrifying when you learn that the number of criminals is getting not smaller, but larger. Tonight's file opens in a fisherman's cabin located along a stream near a bleak stretch of Atlantic coast. It is late in the evening, and John Perry is resting after a hearty dinner. His wife, Matilda, enters. John. Hmm? What are you doing? Just resting. Thought you were going to fix the area for my radio. Yeah, I am. When? I just want about ten minutes rest. Seems to me you're always resting. Tilly, please, let's not have an argument. I'm not the one that argues. Okay. You're the one who always starts things. All right, Tilly, all right. You say I'm a nagger, I'm a terrible wife. Tilly, a... I, I didn't say any of those things. You say them all the time, and I'm sick of it. Sick of this old dress I'm wearing. I'm sick of living in this broken-down shack. I'm sick of... Where are you going? Out to fix the area. It's about time. 
left. What is it? A motorboat. Coming up to the dock. Well, who would be coming out here this time of night? I don't know. It's stopping. Stopping here? Uh-huh. Someone's getting off. Who is it? I, uh, can't make them out. Hiya, Tilly. Paul! That's right. Paul, it's so good to see you. Thanks. How in the world did you ever find this place? <laughs> I couldn't get lost in these streams if I tried. <laughs> uh, Paul, you remember John? Hiya, John. Hello. Well, can you stay a while, Paul? Sure. Uh, Tilly. What? We, uh, we only have room here for ourselves. Look, how often does my brother come to visit us? Where would he sleep? In our bedroom. Where we sleep? In the storeroom. What? Where is your bedroom, sis? Right back there. Well, then I think I'll turn in. I'm tired. looking for Sheriff Watson. Well, you came to the right place. You're talking to him. Oh, hello, Sheriff. I'm Jim Taylor, the oh. FBI. Oh, FBI, huh? Yes. Here are my credentials, Sheriff. Oh, fine. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm at your service, Mr. Taylor. What can we do for you? Well, I'm looking for a man who committed a murder about five miles out in the Atlantic. And you think he's around here? Well, let me give you the whole story, Sheriff. Oh, sure. Do you remember the yacht Mermaid II? One that caught fire and sank about two months ago? Yes, I remember that. Well, the mermaid was carrying a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of jewelry when it went to the bottom. Uh-huh. It wasn't insured, so the owner hired a salvage outfit to see if it could come up with the jewelry. I see. Well, they brought about half of it up to the surface to the salvage boat last night. The man who was guarding the jewelry was assaulted and killed. Well. The murderer apparently used a skiff to get out there. We found it this morning down at the mouth of the river. Got any lead on him? Well, there were some clear fingerprints and a bottle of whiskey that was in the skiff. I've sent them off to our headquarters in Washington. Say, you know, your man could be the one that stole a motorboat. What motorboat? Well, Mr. Taylor, I got a call that a motorboat had been stolen down by the mouth of the river last night. Had been sighted going up the river about an hour later. Oh? I was just about to go out and look for that boat when you came in. I see. Why don't you come along with me? I can't, Sheriff. I've got to go back to the hotel to wait for a report on those fingerprints. Well, okay, then. I'll phone you if I find anything. Good. I'll wait for your call. John? Hmm? Want some more coffee? No, thanks. Look, are you still sore about Paul being here? No, I'm not sore, Tilly. It's just that... It's just that my brother isn't welcome in my own home. Well, if you want to put it that way, yes. He's no good, Tilly, for you or anybody else. He's my brother, and he stays here as long as he wants to. Tilly, this is my home, too, you know. Are you starting another argument? No. No, but I will if he sticks around. He went to prison once, and I... John, I've heard enough. Okay. Now, where are you going? Out to do a day's work. You're awake, huh? <laughs> Who can sleep with that husband of yours yelling his head off? I'm sorry. Tilly, ain't you had enough of that guy? Listen, you should know what I go through. Always arguing, always picking on me, always... Hey. What? Where'd you get all this jewelry? Beautiful. friend of mine gave it to me. Gave it to you? Well, not exactly. You see, the stuff's hot and he wants me to get rid of it for him. And I get a piece of the dough for selling it. It's worth about 100,000 bucks. If we sell it, there's a big chunk of cash in it for us. What do you mean, us? You're fed up with this deal around here, aren't you? Sure. Well, you help me sell this stuff, I'll cut you in for half of my end. Huh? You could live in a house in the city, get away from these swamps. Paul! Yeah? When do we start? Hello, 
Sheriff. Hello, Mr. Taylor. I got your message. You were back. You find anything? No, oh, not much. I got a bad description of the man that was seen in the motorboat up the river, but huh? I don't think it's enough to help us. Did you hear from Washington? Yes. The fingerprints belong to a man named Paul Mitchell. Paul Mitchell, huh? That's right. I don't think I know him. Want me to send out an alarm? No, our field office has already done that, Sheriff. Good. This Mitchell was a bad egg. Oh, long record? Well, not particularly long, but vicious. He was sent to jail the last time for stabbing a man to death. Well, how'd he get out of jail? He was paroled. What? Mm. How? Well, in some states, Sheriff, the worst killers have been paroled. Eh, well, this is the answer to that kind of carelessness. That's it. But it doesn't catch our man for it. Mm. Anything else on his record? Oh, yeah. Take a look for yourself, sir. Oh, thanks. Say, Taylor. What? I remember this man. You do? Yes. He's got relatives around here someplace. His sister married a fisherman in this neck of the woods a couple, three years ago. Can you find out this fisherman's name, where he lives? Sure, sure. It'll only take a minute. Wait till I make a phone call, then we can get started. Your Pexis? No, but it'll only take me a minute. I ain't got much. <laughs> Wait till we sell some of this stuff. Mm. First thing I'm going to buy is a fur coat. What do you want with a fur coat? We're going to go south. I don't care. I want a fur coat. <laughs> okay. Look, how are we going to work this? I can't just walk into a place and say I'm selling jewelry. Oh, no, 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 no. I've got some dough. We buy a real good outfit for you. Good. I get some clothes. Then you go into a hawk shop. Yeah. And you tell the man that you lost all your money in bad investments. Oh, and I want to sell some of my jewelry. Right. Oh, that'll be easy. I thought for a minute I would... Oh. Hello, John. I thought you went fishing for the whole day. I did. What brought you back? I, uh, heard something on the radio in my boat. What'd you hear? The police are searching for a killer. For what? For a killer, a m murderer. They gave the description of the man they're looking for. For what? The description fits your brother here. What? That's right. And that boat he came in, he stole it, didn't you, Paul? Suppose I did. You admit it was you then? Yeah. Paul, you told me... Never mind what I told you, sis. You know the deal or not? I'm in. What do you mean by that, Tilly? I'm going to leave. But Paul. But he's going to jail. Are you kidding? Tilly, we got to turn him in to the police. No. But Tilly, we You're got to. You're not going to blow any whistle on me. Paul, put down that chair. I will as soon as I finish. Paul. Yes, sir. I better finish packing. <laughs> Turn in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now, a word to fathers about security for the family. Fathers, for the next few minutes, I'm going to ask all of you to take off your glasses. No, I don't mean the ones on your nose. I mean the rose-colored glasses that so many of you have been looking through for so long. Take them off so you can face some facts honestly, facts that will startle you. Facts that will make you think. Ready? All right. Ask yourself this question. If I should die, how would my family get through the critical years before the youngest child finished high school? How long would my wife and children continue to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? Please don't say to yourself, Oh, I guess they'd get along all right. That's those rose-colored glasses again. What you're after now is a true and honest answer. To help you get it, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers which has these three advantages. First, it's simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third... When you're finished with this fact-facing chart, 
you will have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Okay, I'm through with rose-colored glasses. How can I get hold of one of these fact-facing charts? And how much does it cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, Swampland Killer. Your FBI does not wish to go on record as being against the practice of paroles for certain prisoners who have committed crimes and repented. But your FBI very strongly wishes to be on record as saying that at times, the practice of parole is unworthy of its name. The theory is good, but the procedure often does not protect society. In the state of Oklahoma, for instance, a mad killer, author Doc Barker, was given a parole a number of years ago with the fantastic provision that he leave the state and never return. After that parole, Doc Barker and his gang were responsible for the killing of 12 people before your FBI finally cornered and arrested him. Those 12 murders concern you, the average American citizen, because there can be another Doc Barker, unless you care enough to pitch in and work, to be sure that you, in every town and village, Enjoy an honest local government. Tonight's file continues with Special Agent Jim Taylor and Sheriff Watson headed up the river toward the cabin of John Perry, where they hope to get a clue regarding the whereabouts of Paul Mitchell, the killer. John Perry's place is right beyond this turn in the river, Jim. Oh, good. We ought to be... Sheriff, what are we stopping for? I just want to see something up ahead there. Yep, that's the motorboat we're looking for. Sheriff, is that Perry's house? Yes. Look, let's get out of this launch and approach the house on land, huh? Good idea. Hey, grab that branch there. All right. Hey, uh... Wait till I tie up here. Can I help you? No. Yeah, that's got it. Let's go. Right. Hold it, Sheriff. What'll we do? I'm going to walk up to the door, Sheriff. You come up behind me with your gun drawn. Okay. Nobody home, huh? Well, there was smoke coming out of the chimney. Wait a minute. Come on. I in. think I hear someone. Come on, let's go. Come in. Hey, look there on the floor. Yes, I see him. No wonder he didn't come to the door. Yes, you know you got... Are you Mr. Perry? Yeah. Yeah, who are you? This is Sheriff Watson. I'm Agent Taylor of the FBI. Oh? Mr. Perry, did Paul Mitchell do this to you? Yes. Yes, he did. He... Ran away with my wife. Huh? It was Mitchell's sister. Yes, I remember. Mr. Perry, do you know where they went? No, but you can look in the swamps. Why would they go there? They were raised there. I see. Are you... You try to rest, Mr. Perry. We'll call the doctor. After that, Sheriff, we've got to get moving. <laughs> going, Paul? I got to hide out in the swamps. Who made you pick a place like that? Well, so the cops won't find us. Oh. Where is it? 
Uh, about a mile beyond the old hotel. What are you pulling into this place for? This is where you get out and get your bus for town. Oh? Are you sure you got everything straight? Yeah, sure. I go into town, I go to a hawk shop. Right. I tell the man that I lost all my money in bad investments. Right. And I just want to pawn this jewelry for a few days. Yeah. All right, now get going. Paul. What? I just happen to think. What do you want to meet me back in the swamp for? Why don't I meet you in town? Let me run this. But I'm going with you to get away from the swamp. Tilly, listen to me. We gotta lay low for a while. Then we can go away. Where are we gonna go to? Oh, I don't know yet. Why can't we go right from town after I get rid of the stuff? Oh, Tilly, will you go? Okay. Oh, wait. Oh, now what? How do I get to the cabin when I come back with the money? Take a cab to Palmer's General Store and call me. Phone number is 102. You'll come and pick me up? Yeah. And you'll be sure to wait for me to Oh, call... look, stop talking so much, will you, and get going? Sheriff, we must have stopped at 15 docks so far. Yeah, I know. Not a sign of Mitchell or his sister. You know, there must be some way we can get a clue on those two. Well, that's the last dock right up there, Head. What do you mean, the last one? The last one before we hit the swamps. Oh. Once we get into those swamps, there'll be no telling which way they took off. I see. Well, then let's hope for the best, huh? Look, there's a man on the dock. Let's see if he knows anything. Hello there. You speaking to me? Yes, sir. Well, what can I do for you? Well, we're looking for a young man, a young girl. Came this way in a motorboat about an hour ago. I saw him. Yep, saw him and heard him talking. You did? I just told you I did. Oh, uh, what did they say? Well, sir, the girl, she got off here. And the fella, he went on up into the swamps. Do you know where either he or the girl went to? Nope. Except that the fella, he yelled back to her to remember to meet him at the cabin. You don't know what cabin, do you? No, sir, we don't. Hmm. But I reckon it's in the swamps, because that's the way he was pointing. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the information. Okay, Sheriff, let's go. Should we head to the swamps? No, that'll be too much like finding a needle in a haystack. What else can we do? Well, I think I've got a plan, Sheriff. Let's turn this boat around, head back to your office. <laughs> Did you get the doll? Yeah, sure. How much? Eight thousand. Eight thousand for a hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff. Oh. Well, I'm sorry. That's all I could get. Oh. Are you at Palmer's store? Yeah, I'm waiting for you. You gonna pick me up? I'll be right down there. Well, we ain't coming back here. No. No. I got an idea. We're gonna take a trip. Oh, good. Where are we gonna go? Cuba. Oh, hold it. Wonderful. Rum drinks and swimming pools and dancing all night. Hold long. it. Hold it. Hold it. Wait till we get there. I'm leaving here right now. Taylor to plane. Taylor to plane. Come in, Sheriff. I haven't spotted a thing yet, Jim. It's okay. I just wanted to check this equipment. It works fine. Yes. Say, these small planes don't move along very fast. Well, that's why we use them, Sheriff. You can really spot a territory from up there, can't you? Yeah. I can see every inch of the swamps down there. Good. Say, Jim. Yes? I think I spot the boat we're looking for. Where is it? It's coming along the stream that's marked with a number 34 on our map. 34. Where will I find that on my map? Yeah. Four. Okay, I've got it. Well, you see that little bend just before the stream widens out? Um... Yes, it's about a mile downstream from where I am. Right. And the boat is heading towards you. And I'd better get moving. Come on, Sheriff. Keep an eye on both of us if you can. Let me know if he stops before I reach him. Right. You're headed toward each other. Still okay, Jim. Now, wait a minute. What's the matter? He's pulling into a cove. Oh, where? Mark Palmer's Cove on your map, Jim. Uh, is that the one about three quarters of a mile from where I am now? Yes, it is. Sheriff, where's the other boat now? Well, it's 
pretty near the shore. About a quarter of a mile, I'd say. I don't know how you're going to get there in time. Well, according to my map, Sheriff, there's a road that runs right alongside this river. I'm going to try and head him off by land. Hello, Tilly. Gee, I thought you'd never get here. Well, I came as fast as I could. <clears throat> Got the dough on you? Yeah. Gee, I think it's wonderful about Cuba. Ever since you told me... Now, look, me, uh, how do we get away from here? I kept the cab I came in. He's waiting. Good. Let's go. Hold it. Hold hey, it. Huh? Who are you, mister? I'm Special Agent Taylor of the FBI. The FBI? What do you want? You and your brother know what I want. Paul, is he arresting us? That's right. But we got to go to Cuba. Where you two go in the future will be decided by a judge and a jury. Paul Mitchell was turned over to the state authorities by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. After being tried and convicted of first-degree murder, he was sentenced to death in the electric chair. His sister, Matilda Perry, as an accomplice, was sentenced to serve 10 years in the state penitentiary. And so your FBI wrote finish on another file, on another career devoted to crime. But as quickly as one criminal career is arrested, another somewhere else begins. There are 25,000 Americans every month who commit their first crime. 25,000 Americans who will either be killed or will spend part of their lives in prison. Now, no country in the world, however wealthy, can stand that kind of drain on its manpower. Sooner or later, the loss of those 25,000 citizens every month will weaken the nation. To prevent that, to see to it that this country does not indulge in national suicide, your FBI is at work 24 hours a day. Soon it hopes the tide will turn, turn in favor of law and order, of decency, and the dignity of human rights. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school, years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Swindling Swami. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. And your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Swindling Swami on this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 
The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. On Christmas Day, Dad's reward is not measured in the neckties he receives, but rather in the smiles of love and gratitude on the faces of his wife and children. Yes, this is the season when home and family come first, Perhaps that explains why, in the Equitable Life Assurance Society, December is the number one life insurance month of the year, the month in which more fathers give their families increased protection than any other. How about it, Father? How about seeing your Equitable Life Assurance Society representative soon? There's still time to give your loved ones the finest gift of all, the gift of security through life insurance. Tonight's FBI file, The Swindling Swami. The world has entered a new era, an era to be called the Atomic Age. For man has conquered the atom and bids fair to learn every secret that's been hidden from him since the beginning of recorded time. We are the wisest people, so far as science is concerned, that the world has ever known. But for all our learning, we are still gullible. Many of us still prove the adage that there's a sucker born every minute. There is one source of learning we refuse to heed. That source is experience. Tonight's file involves a so-called fortune teller named Dr. Arthur St. Clair. His clients come from the very weary, the very nervous, and sometimes the very wealthy. He is just completing his treatment of Mrs. Harriet Brunswick, a wealthy widow. Oh, I'm afraid I'm exhausted, my dear. Oh. I can't go on. Oh, doctor. Oh, this is very tiring, you know. It requires very intense concentration. Oh, I, I know. I, I was wondering, uh, could you just tell me one more thing? Oh, what? Well, you mentioned one day last week that you, you might be able to communicate with my sister. Your sister? Yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I feel certain that I could. Oh. If uh, you want me to? Oh, oh, I do. Uh, When could you do it for me? It takes preparation. Tomorrow? Well, yes. Oh, how wonderful. Uh, uh, Same time as today, Doctor? Yes. Come in at three. Oh, thank you so much. It's nothing, my dear. Nothing. Until tomorrow? <laughs> Until tomorrow. Huh? Great performance. Great. Were you eavesdropping? No, I just got here in time to catch that little hand-kissing routine. I want to talk to you. What about? This. I found it in your overcoat pocket. Why, it's a scratch sheet. Yes, it is. And it's got the entries for today's races. Now, where in the world is that... Say that. You've got your bets marked down, and you're betting 90 bucks. Now, where did you get 90 bucks? Answer me. I, uh... Cast a check. Oh, no. Oh, now, let me explain, my dear. We just got out of New York in time to beat that last rap. But I... When we came out here and opened up this fortune-telling dodge, you promised me you wouldn't do any more check-writing. I prefer talking about more important things. This is important enough. Now, listen to me. I have got this Brunswick person ready to go. This one could be the jackpot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, now, I mean it. 
she has asked to talk to her dear departed sister. Are you telling the truth? Margaret. All right. When do you produce her? Tomorrow. That is, if you're prepared. Listen, I know that newspaper obituary of her sister like it was my own life story. Very well, then. Get behind the curtains. What for? That would be a good idea if we had a rehearsal. You mean commune with the spirits? Yes. And if you contact anyone, find out who won the fourth race. Meanwhile, in the Los Angeles office of your FBI, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated with colleague Bill Madison. Taylor has just received a report from FBI headquarters in Washington. Bill, I've got a surprise for you. What's that, Jim? What do you think is in Los Angeles? Well? An old friend, Arthur St. Clair. King Arthur, the bad check man? That's right. St. Clair wrote a bad check that was passed at the Hotel Wollaston. Handwriting matched perfectly, according to this report from headquarters. King St. Clair. Mm -hmm. How long has it been since we missed him in New York? Oh, almost a year now. Wasn't he traveling with a woman in the East? Yes, a woman he introduced as his wife. Have we got a description of her in the office? Yes, we've got that circular New York sent out on him last year. When did he pass that check at the hotel? Let's see. Uh, uh, here it is. Two weeks ago today. Hmm. How did the hotel happen to cash it? St. Clair had a counterfeit credit card. Oh. Bill's car outside? Yes, right in front of the building. Why? Let's take a little ride. Maybe we can get a lead on St. Clair over at the hotel. <laughs> Spirit of Ella Brooks, come in. Spirit of Ella Brooks, come in. Do, do you think that will help, Doctor? Oh, I've tried every way I know to contact your dear sister. Oh, but it's difficult. Oh, yes, it must be, Doctor. Look, um, if you can't do it... Oh, uh, I haven't given up yet. Now, concentrate, my dear. Hold out my hand. Maybe we'll succeed this time. Oh, I feel so comfortable holding your hand like this, Doctor. That's fine. Now, we shall try to contact your sister again. Oh, spirit of Ella Brooks, come in. Oh. Dear. Speak to your dear sister. Oh, oh yes. Uh, Ella, I, I've missed you very much. I have been with you always. Well, I, I felt that, but I've been unable to, to, to speak to you until I met Dr. St. Clair. Dr. St. Clair is a great man. Oh, I know that, Ella. If you have any questions, Mrs. Brunswick, you'd better ask them now. Harry. Sometimes it's difficult to maintain Harry. contact over a long period. Oh, yes, yes, I understand. Uh, Ella? Yes, Harry? I'm very lonesome. What shall I do? You should find a good companion. You are alone too much. Oh, you're right. You're so right. Uh, uh, can you suggest anyone, Ella, dear? Uh, Ella, come back. Ella. Ella. Mrs. Brunswick. Mrs. Brunswick. Margaret. Margaret. What do you want? She's fainted. You got any smelling salts? Oh, uh, I don't think so. Well, run down to the drugstore and get some. Okay. Make it as quick as you can. Brunswick. Uh, oh, wh where am I? Oh, perfectly safe, my dear. Oh, oh, doctor, I, I must have fainted. Yes, you did. I'm so sorry. Oh, now that's quite all right, my dear. Doctor, did, did you hear what my sister said? Uh, very distinctly. I mean, what she said about my needing a companion. Uh, yes, 
I remember that, Mrs. Brunswick. Oh, please call me Harriet, Doctor. <sighs> Thank you, my dear. I do so wish that I, I could find a companion. A companion like you. Harriet, I'm so glad you said that. Are you? Yes, my dear. When you fainted, your sister's spirit returned, and she had one more message. Oh, oh, what did she say? Her one desire was that we become companions for life. Oh, if that could only come true. Do you mean that? Yes. <sighs> now I can tell you what is in my heart. I fell in love with you the first time you walked in that door. Oh, no. I never dared tell you. Oh, Arthur, I, I, I felt the same way. Really? Yes. Harriet, we must get married tonight. T tonight? Oh, but this is, this is so sudden. I must have time to think. But, darling... Oh, no, please, I'll, I'll go home now. I, I'll call you later. When? Tonight at, at seven. Very well, darling. I shall live in delightful agony till then. <laughs> Are you the bell, Captain? Yes, sir. Something I can do for you? Here are my credentials. Huh? Federal Bureau of... Hey, you're a G-man, huh? That's right. Would you please take a look at this picture on the circular here? Tell us whether you know this man and woman. Uh-huh. I, uh, don't know the woman. But you recognize the man? Yeah, that's Dr. St. Clair. Hey, what do you know about him? Nothing much. He came in here one day and he wanted to make a bet on a couple of horses. Yes. So I introduced him to a bookmaker who hangs around here. Is the uh, bookmaker around here now? No, sir. The manager found out about him last week and threw him out. I see. Well, I wanted to find out where St. Clair was living. Well, I know how you might be able to get his address. Oh, how? Well, sometimes the doctor used to go out to the track, and he used to take that racetrack cab that runs from in front of the hotel. Uh -huh. Sometimes the cab would pick him up at home. Do you know this cab driver? Uh-huh. His name is Al West, and he'll be here tonight at 8. So will I. Let's hope Mr. West has a good memory. Dr. Sinclair speaking. Hello, dear. Oh, my dear Harriet. Have you... Have you decided? Yes. Which? I'll marry you. Wonderful. Uh, let us run away, then, tonight. All right, dear. Uh, you wait at home. Yes. And I'll call you when I'm ready to leave. I'll be waiting. Goodbye. Goodbye, my love. Real happy, ain't you? I... <clears throat> oh, hello, Margaret. Don't throw that phony charm at me. I was listening to your phone call on the extension. Eve's dropping again, eh? Now, look. Shut up and sit down. Margaret. If you've got any idea that you'd like to run barefoot over that dame's bank book, I've got some news for you. Our original deal still goes. We cut everything right down the middle. I'm just trying to make a score for us. I wouldn't believe you if you told me my name was Margaret. What are you going to do now? I'm going to call your girlfriend and tell her you can't make it. Put down that phone. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Hello? Hello, darling. I'll be over in ten minutes. Turn in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now, a word to fathers about security for the family. Father, imagine for a moment that you're on the witness stand, waiting to be cross-questioned. In just a few seconds, we're going to shoot a tough question at you. It's a question that nine fathers out of ten spend most of their life dodging, a fact that most heads of the families don't like to face. Here it is. If you should die, how would your family get through the critical years before the youngest child finished high school? How long would your wife and children continue to be well-fed, 
well housed and well clothed. Yes, how long can they get along without the breadwinner? Isn't it about time you stopped dodging that issue, Father? Isn't it about time for you to face the truth? To help you do just that, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers which has these three advantages. First, it's simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third, when you're finished with this fact-facing chart, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Say, that's something that not one father in a hundred knows. Where do I get one of these fact-facing charts, and how much does it cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow, or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I... T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Swindling Swami. Each of us has in him certain desires for things which we do not as yet have the good fortune to possess. When the power of those desires to affect our life is kept within bounds, they add up to a characteristic known as ambition. But when the hopes and desires swell up and overpower us, then they become classified as greed. With ambition, any of us can achieve a measure of greatness, for there is greatness within the grasp of every one of us. But when greed takes the upper hand, then we start on the road to becoming a criminal. For greed in itself violates a law, an ancient law which says, Thou shalt not covet. <laughs> Tonight's file continues in the Los Angeles field office of your FBI. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned from his trip to the Hotel Wollaston. Hello, Jim. Get anything? Yes, I think so. Oh, did I receive a phone call in the last couple of minutes? No. Who are you expecting to call? The bell captain at the Hotel Wollaston. Didn't you get to see him? Yes, but a cab driver named Al West is going to give him some information to pass on to us. Who's Al West? Well, he's picked St. Clair up at his home a couple of times. I'll get it. Fine. Taylor speaking. Hello, Mr. Taylor. This is George. Oh, yes, George. What did Wes tell you? He said that he used to drop Dr. St. Clair off when they came home from the track at this address. 797 Mount Hope Avenue. 797 Mount Hope Avenue. That's right. Thanks, George. Come on, Bill. We've got St. Clair's address. Are you happy? Supremely. Ah. Harriet, hmm? how did you happen to pick Sunbeam Manor for our honeymoon, dear? Oh, I was just looking through that magazine at the apartment, and I liked the picture so much, I tore out the ad and decided we just had to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur. Yes, dear? Uh, uh, could I ask something of you? Name it, my love. Well... I'd like to speak to my sister, Ella, again. Hmm. Uh, that will be difficult. Oh. I don't think I'll be able to get her voice up here in these mountains. Oh. Uh, but tell me. Yes? Do you remember Ella's handwriting? Oh, uh, not too well. Why? When we get to the hotel, I just might be able to get Ella to write you a note. <laughs> Bill. Yes? See that woman just coming out of that house? Well? Doesn't she look like St. Clair's wife? Hey, you're right. Come on, let's stop her. Okay. Mr. 
Mrs. St. Clair. Uh, yes? Well, Mrs. St. Clair, we're looking for your husband. Well, so am I. He knocked me cold and ran out on me. Wait a minute. Who are you? We're from the FBI. FBI? Oh. Do you know where he went? <sighs> well, I might as well tell you. He was going to pick up some dame and elope with her. But aren't you two married? Sure, but that ain't going to stop Arthur. Where did he go? Maybe we can head him off. Well, you'll have to hurry. He went from here to her apartment at 1400 North Dover Boulevard. What was the woman's name? Mrs. Harriet Brunswick. And when you catch him, you can give Arthur a message from me. Yes, what is it? You can tell him I always knew he liked horses, but I never thought he'd elope with one. <laughs> Arthur. Yes, dear? Now that we're all settled, would you mind terribly? Would I mind what? Trying to get that note from Sister Ella. Oh, of course not. Uh, wait till I get my slate. Oh, can you get the note with that? Of course. Now, uh, let's see what Sister Ella has to say. Hmm? Uh, sit right here. Thank you. Now, you must concentrate. I'm beginning to see writing on the slate. Oh, Arthur, what, what does it say? Well, I can't quite make it out oh, yet. Ella never did have a good handwriting. Oh, there, there. I have it now. She thinks we ought to get a home in the... Country. Oh, that, that's just like Ella. She never could stand the city. She... Oh, it's fading now, my dear. Oh. Well, I'm afraid that'll be all I can get today from Ella. Oh, Arthur. Well, that was grand. Say... What? Do you remember those cottages we passed on the road? Yes. But why yes. don't I go down and see how much they want for one? Oh, yes. Oh, my dear, I'm so sorry. What's the matter? I just remembered something. I... <laughs> I came away from the house so quickly I forgot to bring any cash. Oh, that's <laughs> all right. You go find the cottage, and by the time you're packed, I'll have arranged with the hotel to get all the cash we need. Darling, you think of everything. Jim. Jim. Oh, I'm in here, Bill. This is Mrs. Brunswick's apartment? That's right. How'd you get in? Superintendent opened the door for me. Did you find anything? Well, I've just been going through this desk. What are those papers? Bills from a grocery department store and one from a garage. I'm going to call them now. The garage? Yes. Oh, St. Clair was here all right. How do you know? Well, the circular on St. Clair said that he smoked a special brand of Turkish cigarettes. There's some stubs of that brand in that ashtray over there. I see. Hello? Hello. Uh, North Street Garage? Yeah? This is Special Agent Taylor of the FBI. Do you have a car there belonging to a Mrs. Brunswick? She took it out. Could you give me the license number of that car, please? Don't know it. Well, do you know the make? 46 Caddy. Mm -hmm. Have you any idea where she was going? She said to get it ready for a long trip. Oh, I see. Well, thank you very much. Well, it wasn't much. Car is out. All the attendant knew was the woman is prepared to go on a long trip. I think I have an idea where she might be going. Really? Yes. Come here a minute, Jim. I want you to take a look. Harriet. Harriet, darling. Ah. I found the most beautiful cottage. Costs only 10,000 cash and... Harriet. You've been crying. Oh, Arthur, how could you? How could I walk my life? Arthur, while I was downstairs, I bought this paper with your picture on the front page. Oh, Arthur. Yeah, let me see that. Why, I'll sue them for every penny they've got, my dear. It's all a pack of lies. Did you get the money from the hotel? Yes, I did, but I'm not going to give it to you. Why not? Well, I'm, I'm afraid that story is true. Look, you've got to give me the money. No, Arthur. Give it to me, I said. No, you let go of me. You let go of me. Take your hands off, huh? St. Clair. Take him. Oh. Who are you? Well, from the FBI, St. Clair. I should have known she'd call you. Well, Mrs. Brunswick didn't call us, but she did lead us here. Well, what do you mean? 
Well, that ad for this hotel that you tore out of the travel magazine, Mrs. Brunswick, we just checked with the new copy of the same magazine and found out what was missing. You're a real genius. Oh, no, I'm not a genius, St. Clair. I'm not even a good fortune teller. But I can read your future. What's that? You're going to take a trip, and you'll be away for a long, long time. Arthur St. Clair was tried and convicted for his crimes and was sentenced to a long term at a federal penitentiary. His original wife, Margaret, was turned over to local authorities for complicity in his crimes. You've often heard that crime does not pay. And while there are no truer words in the English language, the criminal does not always pay immediately. Sometimes, and is in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, he escapes punishment at first. But that is no escape. For neither your FBI nor any other law enforcement agency admits defeat. Their business is catching criminals. And they perform their duties 24 hours a day, every day in the year. Though he may gain a momentary advantage at first, the criminal soon learns the inherent truth of the adage that crime does not pay. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. But first... Let me answer a question. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school, years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Little Tough Guy. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Little Tough Guy, on This Is Your FBI. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Now that the new year is only four days away, once again we hear jokes about resolutions, turning over a new leaf. But deep down inside, there's not a one of us that doesn't seriously consider making some important improvement 
either in himself or in his relations with those near and dear to him. Probably that's why in January so many fathers increase their family's protection with the Equitable Life Assurance Society. So, fathers, this year, why not make the finest New Year's resolution of all? Resolve now to give your family increased security through life insurance. Then keep that resolution by getting in touch with your Equitable Society representative tomorrow. Tonight's FBI file, Little Tough Guy. There are seasonal trends in every business, including crime. In summer, the majority of crimes are committed against people. Crimes like murder and felonious assault. In winter, however, the criminal turns his attention to crimes against property. Crimes like auto stealing, arson, and armed robbery. During the year of 1946, there were an unprecedented number of those crimes against property. It is important to the future of the country to know that of all the arrests that were made by police throughout the nation, 55% of those arrested were found to be under the age of 25. There have been various reports that juvenile delinquency is being combated successfully throughout America today. Progress has been made, but there is still much to be done. The number of persons under the age of 18 arrested in 1946 is greater than the number arrested in our last peacetime year, 1941. That fact constitutes a menace to you, the American people. Tonight's file opens in a trash-littered vacant lot near the crowded tenement district of a large Midwestern city. A young boy is idly playing in this lot as a second youth approaches. Hiya, Joe. Huh? Oh, Tommy! Wait a minute. What's your hurry? I ain't in no hurry, Tommy. Well, what'd you try to run away for? I... I was just getting up, that's all. Where you been all week? I'd been around... Not where I could see you. I looked for you, Tommy, honest. To pay me off? Yeah. Well, it ain't too late now. Let's have it. I... I spent it, Tommy. Don't give me that. Honest. You know what that means, don't you? Oh, no. No, wait, Tommy. Give me a chance, will you? <coughs> Get up. Please. Oh, Tommy, leave me alone. Get up, I said. No, Tommy, No. <coughs> To learn you not to run out on me. Wait, Tommy, I'll pay you. Now? No, just let me go home. I'll get the dough and bring it right back. Well, okay. But get back here fast. Oh, I will. Honest, I will. <laughs> huh? Regular killer, ain't you? Quite a workout you gave me. What's it to you, mister? Oh, no, no. Save that for somebody your own size. What were you slugging him for? He didn't pay up. What do you mean? I charge him a dime a week for not hitting him. He was a week behind on his dues. He pays you for not hitting him? Yeah. All the kids in the neighborhood do. <laughs> That's quite a touch. Just one of my touches, mister. No kidding. What are some of your others? <laughs> Why should I spill them to you? I might be able to give you a few more you don't know about. Come on. Let's you and me go get a soda. Mama. I'm in here. Oh. Hiya, honey. Where you been? Downtown. Doing what? Working. Wipe that pool chalk off your coat. I tell you, Norm, I was working. Yeah, I know, I know. You got a big deal. We make a big bundle. That's right. Well, please explain one thing to me, will you? What? You got a phone call right after you left here this morning. It was someone who sounded all of 16 years old, and he said he was your partner... Now, what's the rib? Well, uh, he ain't exactly my partner, but it wasn't a rib. What? I, uh, I, I got the kid working with me. 
What are you going to do? Hijack some bubble gum? Very funny. Just so happens I've lined up a real good score. <laughs> this I want to hear about. Okay. Now, here's a setup. There's a couple of dozen crates of army binoculars stored in a little building down in the freight yard. Yeah. It's surplus stuff that they're selling to people. There's real big demand for them now. Mm-hmm. Well, the building they're in can be entered by a little window at the back near the roof. A window that's just big enough for a kid to crawl through. Now, does it sound so funny? Where'd you get this kid? Well, I picked him up just a few days ago. He's okay. What's the rest of the caper? I'm renting a truck. Back it right up to the building. The kid crawls through the window, then lets you in? That's right. What about the law? There's a watchman. I've got his movement time. We can load the truck and be out of there before he finishes his rounds. When do you and your little partner go into action? Tonight. Okay, mister. Nice going, Tommy. There's some crates piled up right inside the door. Good. I'll start loading them. You need any help? No, no, no. You, you stay here. Keep your eyes open. What's the matter with you, mister? What do you mean? You scared? You kidding? You act that way. Ah, look, we're wasting time. i got to load those crates. Mm. You're running this, ain't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never mind, I'll handle it. Oh, wait a minute. Shh. Hold on. What are you doing? Oh! oh. Okay, mister. Now you can load on them crates. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Jim, this is Adams. Yes, sir. Detective Fulton from headquarters has just left my office. I'm sending him in to see you. Ken Fulton? That's right. I've assigned you to work on a case with him. Can I come in, Jim? Uh, he's here now, Mr. Adams. Good. I'll talk to you later. All right, sir. Hello, Ken. Hi, Jim. Good to see you. Now, oh, pull up a chair. Thanks. I suppose you came over here to show me that Christmas tie. <laughs> well, that was one of the reasons. The other one's a robbery that took place last night down the freight yard. Oh, huh? what's the story, Ken? Small warehouse was broken into. Mm -hmm. Ten cases of binoculars were stolen. A watchman was slugged. How does the FBI figure in the case? The binoculars were army property. I see. You got any leads? Well, the ground was soft in front of the warehouse. One of our lab men got a good impression of the tires of the truck that was used. You been down there yet? No, no, I was just been on the case myself. Oh. Well, what about the watchman? Was he badly hurt? Well, he's in the city hospital. Did he see the thieves? He hasn't given too coherent a statement yet. He mentioned something about a kid being there. Uh -huh. That's about all. Well, Ken, how do you think we should work this one? Any way you say. I suppose we divide up our activities and save some time. Okay? Okay. Then why don't you go down to the warehouse and see what you can pick up there? I'll go out and interview that watchman at the city hospital. Norma. Um, Wake up, will you? Oh. oh, it's you. How'd the job go? What do you care? What? But you didn't even stay awake to find out if it worked or not. Oh, look, I was up all night. If you'd had any consideration, you would have called. Oh, that would have been real smart. Maybe you wanted me to send you a wire, too. Robbery, a big success, stop all. You stop. Now, how'd it go? Okay. Tell me about it, will you? I knocked off ten cases of binoculars. That was all I could fit on a truck. How'd the kid work out? A little too good. What do you mean? He slugged the watchman. Bad? I don't know. Where's the kid now? I dropped him off at his house. Give him 20 bucks and told him I'd meet him this afternoon. What for? To give him his cut. Are you out of your mind cutting Look, in a kid? Look, I got no intention of meeting him. I had all I wanted, that little guy. Well, what kept you so long? I had to get rid of the stuff. With a fence? Yeah. What'd you get for it? Thirty-five hundred. Thirty-five hundred? Yeah. Oh, baby, you must be dead tired. Let me fix you a nice breakfast and put you to bed. You busy? 
busy, Jim? Oh, hello, Ken. How'd you make out? I think I picked up a couple of pretty good clues. Oh, good. The thieves gained entry to the warehouse by climbing through a small window. Yeah. There's plenty of soot on that windowsill. Whoever climbed in managed to leave a set of excellent prints. <laughs> Very considerate of them. <laughs> I also picked up some shreds of wool that were caught in the woodwork. Uh -huh. They uh, looked like they'd been torn from a sweater. What did you do with the evidence, Ken? Turned it over to Mr. Adams. He's sending it on to your laboratory. Oh, good. Say, how'd you make out? Well, I finally got to talk to the watchman. Give you anything? I think so, yes. Say, what about that kid he saw? Well, he just got a fleeting glimpse of him before he was slugged. And the kid? That's right. He said he'd seen him before, though. That he was one of the gang of youngsters that played around the freight yards once in a while. Did he know his name or where he lived? No, but he knows one of the other kids in the gang. He gave me his name and the school that he attends. Say, did the watchman give you anything on the truck? No. Did he see anyone else? No, the slugging occurred too quickly for him to see anything but the boy. And that kid becomes real important. That's right, Ken. Maybe you better go over there. Okay. And if I get anything that looks good, Ken, I'll call you at headquarters. Norma, what time is it? A little after two. In the afternoon. Yeah. Did you sleep well, honey? Yeah, yeah, fine. Can I get you anything? Uh, not right now, thanks. Well, if you need anything, dear, just let me know. <laughs> What's the joke? <laughs> uh, this new deal. I don't get it. From bum to king in one easy lesson. What are you talking about? That 3,500 sure made a big man out of me. Oh, no, honey, stop that talk. You know that it... W oh, that must be the delivery. What delivery? Well, while you were sleeping this morning, I went out. I bought a few things. Oh, like what? Oh, some dresses, some hats. Huh? Just wait till you see them. Okay, okay. Mr. Prentice live here? That's right, Sonny. Come right in. Okay. Hey, wait a minute. Where's your packages? What are you talking about? I want to see Phil Prentice. Who's that, Norma? It's me, Mr. Tommy Winfield. Huh? Tom Hey, are you the little punk? Out of my way, lady. <laughs> Hiya, mister. What are you doing here? Came to find out why you didn't meet me. How'd you know where I lived? I tailed you here after the job. I uh, figured it would be a good idea to know where to find you, just in case. Phil, throw him out of here. Take it easy, lady. Come on, Junior. Out you go. Wait a minute. Look out, Phil. He's got a gun. That's right, lady. Where? Where'd you get that cap pistol? I bought it with the 20 bucks you gave me. Now, if you think it's a cap pistol, just make a bad move, and I uh, think you'll change your mind. Phil, take that gun away from him. Phil! He ain't got the nerve. He scares too easy. I seen that last night. Phil, do something. There's only one thing he can do. Give me my cut. I'm keeping this gun on both of you till I get it. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now, a word to fathers about security for the family. Father, how do you feel tonight? A little tired, eh? You've had a good dinner, you're contented, and don't want to be disturbed by anything. Well, if that's the way you feel, you'd better turn off your radio for the next 59 seconds because you are going to be disturbed by a question that's coming at you now. If I should die, how would my family get through the critical years until the youngest child finished high school? How long would my wife and children continue to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? That question is so important to your family's happiness that you ought to have an answer based not on guesses or hunches, but on facts. The Equitable Life Assurance Society will help you get these facts. It has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers that has these three advantages. First, it's simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third, when you're finished with this fact-facing chart, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Say, Mr. Cross, that's something I really ought to know. Where can I get this fact-facing chart, and how much do they charge for it? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. 
the Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, Little Tough Guy. In studying the problem of juvenile delinquency, one fact becomes apparent. Children, for the most part, are faithful imitators, and those who form the parade of delinquents are no exceptions. They are imitating their personal heroes, heroes who have gained temporary fame through crime. But the young people of America are not altogether to blame for having selected false idols. That is partly the fault of those who have daily contact with our young ones for they have not made decency and honesty sufficiently attractive. Children will imitate what seems most colorful to them, and for that reason the path to take is clear. When every child is taught that the policeman is more colorful than the criminal he catches, then and only then will juvenile delinquency cease to be a major problem. Tonight's file continues. Special Agent Jim Taylor, attempting to learn the identity of the boy involved in the warehouse robbery, is seated in the principal's office in a neighborhood school. A youngster enters. Is the principal here? No, but uh, come in, Joe. I was sent down to see the principal. I know. I sent for you. Who are you? Well, my name is Taylor. I'm the special agent of the FBI. Huh? I'd like to ask you a couple of questions, if I may. FBI? Joe, you play around the freight yards once in a while, don't you? Well, yeah. I'd like to find out about one of the boys in your gang. Uh Uh-huh. I'd say he's older than you are, about uh, 16. Has dark hair, always wears a yellow striped sweater. Oh, that's... That's who, Joe? I I don't know. Now, look, you just started to tell me why did you change your mind. I didn't. I don't know what you mean. Joe, he's wanted for questioning on a very serious charge. If you know who he is, it's your duty to tell me. But I don't, honest. Are you afraid to tell? Leave me alone. Afraid of what people might think of you for doing your duty? No. No. Look, son, you you may not realize this, but you'd be doing that youngster a great service. You'd be saving him from greater trouble when he grows older. Now, don't be afraid of what you consider squealing, Joe. Now, come on. Let's have his name. Well, it, it sounds like Tommy. Tommy who? Tommy Winfield. You know where he lives? No, but he goes to this school. Is he here today? No, he's absent. Well, Joe, you've been a great help to me. You should be very proud of what you've done. Thank you, son. Look, Tommy, how many times do I have to tell you the fence didn't pay me off yet? You're lying. I happen to know he's telling the truth. That ain't the way them things work. What do you know about selling stolen goods? I made a big study on all of them things. Where? In kindergarten? Never mind the wisecracks. I know more about larceny right now than that husband of yours does. Well, that I wouldn't brag about. I'm giving you one more chance to get that dough up. Otherwise, this gun goes off. Oh, look, kid, will you believe me? Wait a minute, Phil. Uh... You'd... Better pay him off. What? This kid really means business. Now, you're talking, lady. But Norma... The dough's in a drawer in that desk. Which drawer? That top one there. This one here? Yeah, that's the one. Hey, I don't see any... Ow! Now drop that gun. Pick it up, Phil. Right. Now, Junior, we give the orders. It broke my hand. Oh, ain't that too bad. What do we do with him? Let me think. I'm going to warn you right now. If anything happens to me, the cops will know who did it. What do you mean? Ah, he's throwing a blow. Oh. <laughs> now, look, uh, we're going to have to get out of town. This kid knows too much. Yeah. Oh. We'll tie him up in the bedroom. 
Then let's pack and get out of here. Fast. Hi there, Jim. Oh, come on in, Ken. When'd you get back? About a half hour ago. Oh, I stopped by for you at headquarters. Left a message here. Yeah, yeah, I just got it. Do you have any luck? Yes. I've identified the boy we were looking for. Good for you. His name is Tommy Winfield. Where'd you get your information? From the other kid? That's right. Winfield attends the same school. You talked to him? No, he was absent today, but I've been able to definitely link him with a warehouse robbery. How? Well, this boy's been in trouble before. His prints are on file in your department. And you picked up a set? That's right. I have them right here. I've just finished comparing them with the set that you picked up on the windowsill. They're identical, all right. Did you get his home address? Yes, I'm going out there right now. Fulton speaking. Hello, Ken. Jim Taylor. Oh, hello, Jim. How'd you make out? Well, young Winfield wasn't at home, but I think I have a lead on where to pick him up. Good. Oh, by the way, I picked up a sweater that was on his bed. I think we'll find the wool will match the shreds you found on that windowsill. Fine. That ties that up. Yes. Well, I'm going out to look for him, Ken. I'll be in touch with you later. Okay. Your pack? Yeah. Yeah, well, let's go then. Is the kid tied up okay? Yeah, yeah, don't worry about him. Come on. Right. Go ahead. Oh, excuse me, please. Uh, you, Mr. Prentice? What's that to you? I'm a special agent Taylor of the FBI. FBI? Oh, uh, well, uh, what can we do for you, sir? I'm looking for a youngster named Winfield. Tommy Winfield. Never heard of him. Oh? I found a note at his house that he had written saying that if anything were to happen to him, you'd be responsible for it. Oh, why, that's the craziest thing I ever heard of. We don't know any Tommy Winfield. Well, nevertheless, his note did say he was coming here to your apartment. Would you mind terribly if I went inside and looked around? Oh, now, wait a minute. Phil, uh, my husband was objecting be because we're in a hurry. You see, we got to catch a train. It would only take me a minute. Okay, okay, go ahead and look. We'll go on anyway. Come on, Norman. Oh, hold it, Mr. Prentice. Huh? I'd like you both to be here when I search the premises. Look, I told you, we've got to catch a train. Now, get out of the way. I'm sorry, Mr. Prentice. Get away, I said. Phil, you fool. You know, Prentice, if I were you, I wouldn't start to play rough. Oh. Now, you might as well know that I have a search warrant here that I got just in case I ran into this kind of trouble. Now, get back in there, both of you. Okay. Phil. Well, what else can we do? Now, just walk in front of him. We'll take a look around here. Wait a minute. What's in here? It's a closet. Well, was I right? Let's keep looking. Go ahead. Hold it. What's this door? It's another closet. Well, we'll take a look in there anyway. Now, keep out of there. Well. Uh, look, I, I can explain why the kid's in there. Prentice, untie this gag. He pulled a gun on us, tried to stick us up. Yeah, sure, sure. That's what he did. Here, yeah, let me have it. Help me. You gotta help me, please. You're Tommy Winfield? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Tommy, the little tough guy. Huh? Please help me. Help me get out of here, please. You're just like the rest of them, Tommy. When the chips are down, you're not tough at all. <laughs> For his complicity in the robbery... Tommy Winfield was sentenced to a state reformatory. Phil and Norma Prentice were both sentenced to long terms in a federal penitentiary. The number one problem confronting the Federal Bureau of Investigation and every other law enforcement agency in the nation today is juvenile delinquency. If the children of today are allowed to run free and to become the criminals of tomorrow, then America faces a dark future. But that need not be our fate. We are the captains of our own destiny if we will take control. Children of today are no different than they have ever been. But they cannot be allowed merely to grow up. They must be raised. They must be given the advantage of parental guidance. 
The problem of juvenile delinquency today is basically the problem of delinquent parents. For that reason, we especially urge you, the parents of America, to keep a closer watch on your children during 1947. And if you do, you can really make it a happy new year. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. But first, let me answer a question. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school, years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Fugitive Guest. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Fugitive Guest on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.